Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's press briefing. I'm Donna Bush. As always, I'm happy that you can join us via our various CIG television channels, as well as on Radio Cayman. We begin with a prayer from Reverend Jerome Small. We're mindful as well that all across the world there are voices that often go unheard amidst this pandemic. Open the hearts of those around them to truly see and hear them so that they know that they are heard and they are loved. Be with the leaders of all nations, especially the leaders of these Cayman Islands. Give them the foresight to act with clarity, love, and true concern for the well-being of the people they are called to serve. Be with the doctors, nurses, researchers, and all medical professionals who seek to heal and help those affected. Grant to all frontline workers your protection and peace as they put themselves at risk. Amidst the reality of our COVID-19 experiences, we are mindful that soon this year's hurricane season will be upon us. And so we ask you to keep us safe. Grant to us favorable weather, protect us from the unpredictable elements of nature and preserve us from all harm. We make all our prayers with confidence in your love and care through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And thank you, Reverend Small. We now welcome our esteemed panelists, His Excellency the Governor, Mr. Martin Roper, Premier the Honorable Wayne Panton, the Honorable Education Minister, Juliana O'Connor Conley, and Minister for Health, the Honorable Sabrina Turner. Joining us on Zoom online is Dr. John Lee, the Chief Medical Officer, as well as some members of the media. In studio with us, we have the Police Commissioner, Mr. Derek Byrne, members of the media, senior civil servants and elected officials, as well as our sign language interpreter. We now go to Dr. Lee, who joins us via Zoom. Dr. Lee? Good evening, everyone. And um, it's, um, it's been a long time since we've had one of these briefings. Um, I'm talking to you from home as I'm currently in quarantine, having just returned from the United Kingdom. We have had 350 PCR tests since yesterday. And of these, there was one positive traveler, but of course, the thing that is of most interest is that there were two community positives. These community positives are doing well. One has been admitted to hospital and the other person remains at home, although symptomatic. The person was admitted to hospital was not admitted for a traditional COVID reason. They had a fever and were otherwise unwell, um, um, but it was thought not to be related to respiratory illness, so there was not any immediate cause for alarm, um, which meant that a number of staff were unfortunately required to isolate as um, it was not um, realized the danger that was, was potentially there. These staff were immediately isolated and are, are, are safe in government accommodations. This all occurred last night. The positive result was returned in casualty um, in the uh, middle of the evening and contact tracing began immediately and has continued throughout today. So far, um, a, a range of tests have been done, swabs have been done on all of the immediate household contacts and people around um, the care environment of this person. There have been no other positive tests. In all, we have had 24 negative tests, which include four children. Um, those children are of interest because two of them actually attended school today, um, but those two children have tested negative and are clearly now in isolation, having been removed from school the moment that um, the risk was identified. The, um, of the people that were um, uh, involved in this, um, the, both the person that was admitted to hospital and the person's other relative were both vaccinated, fully vaccinated. 
as were um, five other people fully vaccinated and one partially vaccinated. I think um, this is something that we've all been waiting to happen. I certainly have been waiting for it to happen for many, many months. I think we've done incredibly well here in Cayman. I thank the public for their cooperation throughout the pandemic up to now. Um, it only goes to show how easy it is for this very infectious virus to get into the community, the fact that we now have these two community cases. But immediately, as, as we have seen before, but not for many months, immediately the public health team sprang into action despite the hours and um, went about their role of contact tracing and isolating everybody that was necessary to do so. I thank them very much for this. Throughout the whole of the pandemic, they have worked without ever any question, without ever any hesitation, and they have done a really good job. So thank you for their ongoing support in the pandemic. Necessarily, we always focus in these situations on the immediate contacts of the people. So when it becomes contacts of contacts and people further away, more distant, we do not provide immediate uh, testing for large, large numbers of people. It's just simply not necessary. As we can be see, that 24 of these people are negative. So that is very reassuring. If they are negative, once they're isolated, they're totally safe. They can't any longer transmit any developing infection or any infection that might develop, it, should they develop it. And it's also really great news, as I mentioned earlier, that the two people who are, have tested positive are, are doing well. I do wish them and their families all comfort in this time, because I'm sure it's a, a, a time of, of great concern. The HSA, not only has the public health team obviously jumped into action, but in case there is any need, the, the flu clinic has reopened next to the accident and emergency department. As you look at the accident and emergency department, it's on the left. Should you need to attend, please call the flu hotline if you have any symptoms and want any advice or directions. That continues to be open. And also the respiratory care unit is going to be stood up at the Health Service Authority in case there are any, um, the need to isolate people with COVID in, in this area. As far as the vaccination status is concerned, we have now vaccinated 5,000, sorry, 52,622 people with the first vaccination of the Pfizer vaccine. That's 74% of the population of 71,106. And it's, it's been re reassuring to know that the um, work of the government and of all of the people promoting vaccination has meant that there has been an uptick in the vaccination. So the average vaccination rates um, on a daily basis per week um, over the last four weeks was 37 on average every day for the four weeks ago, three weeks ago, 39, two weeks ago, 75, and over the last week, 126 people on average per day. All adults, um, um, have reached a vaccination rate of over 75%. So that's a really excellent vaccination rate. And it's, it is commendable that people continue to come forward to vaccination. And I thank them for that, because as we can see, vaccination is something that protects you from serious illness. Thank you very much, Donna. Thank you very much, Dr. Lee. I'd like to now call on the police commissioner, Mr. Derek Byrne, for an update. Good evening and thank you for the opportunity to provide a brief update on where we are with policing and security as it relates to COVID enforcement. Uh, we continue to operate in a relatively safe, calm and stable environment. Compliance with the public health regulations is being led by Travel Time Cayman, supported by Public Health and RCIPS. And for their part, the RCIPS deal with the detected breaches, which are those that reach a threshold in contravention of the current control and suppression regulations contained in SL 41 of 2021 dated the 14th of May. Just just some, so, some background. Generally, from a policing perspective, what we are seeing is an overly relaxed approach to the threat and risk of harm in the community from COVID by persons who are resident in the community here in the Cayman Islands. And that is predominantly breaching regulations by visiting persons in quarantine and isolation to deliver goods and remaining there for longer than is permitted. And on some occasions we're seeing people engaging in drinking 
and playing dominoes adjacent and lawns adjacent to the place of isolation or, or, or um, quarantine. So I'm asking to, to, to remind persons that this should not happen as it defeats the purpose and intent of the regulations to protect the community and control the risk um, of transmission. And just maybe to double back and look at regulation two of the current regs and contact means being closer than six feet to a person in isolation or quarantine and remaining there for more than five minutes. What we are not seeing um, are incoming travellers breaching the regulations by leaving quarantine or isolation facilities and indeed we are not seeing interference with the geotagging process which is really encouraging. Some of the issues we are seeing coming across my desk and in briefings that incoming travellers should carefully read the travel time conditions before signing and agreeing to full compliance to ensure their personal and community safety. Travel time are there to help and assist in the process. Incoming travellers should not pass or attempt to pass any item brought into the islands to any persons in the community during the period of quarantine or isolation. It seems that there are some persons may not fully, fully appreciate the risk here. To make this work, we are seeking full cooperation of everybody in the community to continue to maintain the excellent results that, been, that have been achieved over the past 18 months or so, and for the community to understand that there remains an ongoing risk to community transmission if we do not get it right. I take this opportunity to remind all persons that a breach of the current regulations is a criminal offence carrying a fine of 10,000 Cayman dollars or two years imprisonment. And I mentioned that files are with the Director of Public Prosecution for consideration and the two cases are listed for hearing in Magistrates Court commencing next week. Thank you, Commissioner Byrne. We now go to our Premier, the Honourable Wayne Panton. Thank you, Donna, and um, thank you to all of us. Sorry, to all of you for, for joining us today, um, and particularly for those who are listening and watching uh, on the various media. Um, good afternoon, good evening to everyone. We issued a press statement um, early this morning acknowledging that, um, as you've heard, a local resident has been admitted to Georgetown Hospital. Um, showing potential symptoms associated with COVID-19. Of course, that was subsequently um, confirmed. Um, I want to say that um, government, cabinet and caucus in particular have been working, some of us through the night, um, definitely from early this morning. We had a meeting of caucus and cabinet, been receiving regular updates from the chief medical officer, Dr. John Lee. Um, disturbing him in his quarantine arrangements. Um, apologies for that, sir. Um, we've certainly been um, working with the public health, health officials and getting um, advice and information from them. Um, and as, as has been noted, the confirmation was that um, the individual, the resident who had been admitted to the hospital, along with another member of the household, um, have been confirmed positive with the virus. Now, um, upon learning that none of the individuals who tested positive had a recent travel history, obviously our immediate concern was uh, with the potential impact on the community, um, which we soon learned thanks to the quick work of public health, um, included school-age children. I, I want to commend public health tireless efforts and rapid response to this evolving situation. Given the close-knit nature of the, of the neighborhood involved and the families involved, the uh, RCIPS has secured the area for everyone's safety and individuals um, who have been advised to isolate and will be fitted with geotracking devices uh, from Travel Cayman and monitored by public health, of course, um, I ask everyone to please respect the privacy of the families involved. Um, I take this opportunity to again reassure the public that this situation is under control. Throughout the day, 
Public Health has been conducting interviews, tracing and tracking the movements of the two positive individuals, and testing those who came into contact with them. While you may have heard that the two students from Clifton Hunter High School reside in the home, both students um, were removed from their classes this morning, taken home, and tested. Um, based on the evidence available, we are confident that the students, teachers, and staff, and bus drivers of Clifton Hunter are, are safe. The Honorable Minister for Education will speak more on this shortly. As is the nature with such matters, public health is still developing the picture of the extent of the contacts. Therefore, we anticipate having a more clear and complete picture of the situation tomorrow. Um, we intend to have another press conference tomorrow afternoon in order to hopefully provide more wholesome information. I want to say thanks to the efforts of public health and other authorities since this incident began. And we can assure you that everything is being done to keep everyone safe. Our response to this incident was an opportunity to put into practice our plans to deal with our first cases of COVID-19 local transmission. I'm proud to say that the results so far prove the effectiveness, efficiency, and resilience of our plans. While this appears to be um, an isolated incident, incident, the uncomfortable truth is there is going to come a point when COVID is more prevalent in our community. This incident has also been a real life reminder that our local context is and will be changing um, over time and certainly possibly in the near future. We encourage everyone to take necessary precautions to pre protect themselves. Beyond testing and vaccination, I wish to remind you that the, the flu and respiratory clinics um, have been re reopened. I know Dr. Lee mentioned it. You'll probably hear the Minister for Health mention it again as well. Um, it is a good thing and good to be repeating. Um, if you have symptoms, the flu hotline is also open 24 hours for you to get advice from public health while remaining in your home. And as I said, uh, Minister um, Turner will be speaking to this momentarily. When you venture out of home, especially going into enclosed areas with others such as supermarkets, stores, and restaurants, or if you're interacting with vulnerable people such as the elderly, we encourage you to wear masks and practice good hand hygiene. Since the start of the pandemic, we have been sharing public health safety information through a range of channels including online, radio, print, TV, and high traffic areas we all frequently visit. You can expect to see more of that as we amplify our public health safety and hygiene communications as a constant reminder that we must keep working together to protect ourselves our community, and our community and limit any spread of COVID-19. Of course, if you haven't already taken the COVID-19 vaccination, this would be a really good time to consider going to get it. And I strongly advise you to do so. Out of an abundance of caution, while we work to identify the source of the transmission virus, I also suggest that people not socialize or attend parties or other large gatherings for at least the next 24 to 48 hours, or until we have a more definitive answer. Care for others and compliance with public health safety measures were essential to getting us through the peak of our COVID-19 response. And in, indeed, due to no evidence of community spread in a very long time, our behaviors may well have shifted and some of our discipline around community health, health may have lapsed. It is time to re return to community-wide vigilance and compliance as COVID-19 is here. And remember 
that community builds country. People of the Cayman Islands, we know what we need to do. The same team of public health professionals, experts, and advisors that brought us through the initial shock of COVID-19 is the one that's taking us through this next phase and those that follow. I trusted them then and I trust them now. And so should you. Today was a test run with real world implications. And we let science guide us in taking the necessary steps to protect the safety of our people and our children because at the end of the day, it is our people and our residents that are most precious and most important. This PAC government will do whatever is needed at all times to protect us from the worst effects of COVID-19 and its variants. And we hope you will do your part as well. Stay safe, Cayman, and we will get through this together. Thank you. Thank you very much, Premier Panton. We now go to His Excellency. Thank you. Thank you very much, Donna. And good afternoon, um, everybody. And um, my first thoughts on hearing the news that we have uh, local transmission of COVID was, of course, concern for the, for the people who have tested positive for this very nasty virus. And I just want to wish them a very speedy recovery and send them our thoughts and prayers, both from Lizzie, my wife, and myself. Um, and I want to thank everyone involved in our response from all the healthcare professionals, the emergency responders, but also that the civil service who quickly acted to ensure the necessary protocols were followed. Um, I think as Premier has said and Dr Lee, we're perhaps not surprised this has happened. I think we all expected this to happen at some point. Um, and this is really all part of uh, being able to live with this, uh, with this <coughs> virus as we, as we move forward. And we may get more uh, situations uh, like this. Um, but I, I do think it was reassuring what Dr. Lee said, that all, all those tests that have been done today very quickly, so far, all of those uh, were negative. So that's really encouraging and reassuring. And as we've heard, there's a thorough investigation underway to pinpoint the route of transmission. Um, I want to thank the police commissioner for his update um, on suspected quarantine breaches. Uh, it is increasingly clear that many of these involve members of our community visiting friends and family visiting travelers in quarantine rather than travelers themselves deliberately leaving quarantine. And, but however it has happened, it should be a wake-up call to all of us that whilst quarantine measures remain in place, and as we try to get as many people as possible double jabbed, everyone must please obey the rules and respect the rules. Um, as we heard, uh, people will be prosecuted and there are cases coming to the courts next week. Now, though we accept that COVID has returned, we do need to remind ourselves of the simple steps that we must all take to minimize the risk of catching or spreading the virus. Getting vaccinated is clearly the number one priority. Please do get your jab. It may not stop you getting COVID, but it will, for the large majority of people, stop you getting seriously ill or dying. Um, and we only have about enough vaccines left uh, for 3,000 people. And remember that these do expire at the end of October. So now really is the time to come forward for your vaccine. And we should all continue to practice regular hand washing, not touching our faces, wearing face coverings where appropriate, as well as maintaining social distancing. And as has been said, maybe for the next 24 hours or so, best to avoid large gatherings. I know many of you who came forward for your vaccine early in the rollout program are eagerly awaiting news on if and when we will be offering you a booster. So it is excellent news that today the UK's Medicines and Healthcare Products Regulatory Agency has granted emergency approval for Pfizer and AstraZeneca vaccines to be used as booster shots. The UK's Joint Committee on Vaccine and Immunisation recommended last week that those with weakened immune systems should be offered a third jab. They were meeting again today to consider all of the available scientific evidence to inform their decision on whether there should be a broader booster program, and if so, how widespread that should be. The British government is expecting to receive their advice in the next day or two. And I've said before that we would be given sufficient vaccine for a matching booster program that we may push to go even further 
than the UK, given our very low levels of community transmission and immunity that infection brings. So in conclusion, despite the worrying news of community transmission, I want to reassure you all that thanks to the vaccine, Cayman is in a safer position as anywhere in the world with a good level of vaccine uptake, coupled with excellent medical facilities and surge capacity if we need it. So let's not panic about this news. Our response should be calm and measured. But for those of you still choosing not to be vaccinated, I again implore you now to rethink for your well-being and for the sake of others that care about you. Every life is precious and we want you to have the best possible chance of surviving should you become infected. Thank you. Thank you very much, Your Excellency. We now go to Minister for Health, the Honourable Sabrina Turner. Good evening and thank you, Donna. Thank you for joining us here again today. And in light of the new information we've received, I would like to reiterate and reinforce my message from yesterday that the Cayman Islands healthcare system is fully prepared and we're ready for any surge of COVID-19 cases in our islands. I outlined yesterday that what, what has been done over the past 18 months to ensure that we as a country are in the best possible position to handle a swift increase of COVID-19 cases should that eventuality occur, despite our best laid plans to prevent and curtail community spread. I must again reiterate that the core element of our protection is and will be for the foreseeable future is the uptake of the COVID-19 vaccine by the majority of our eligible population. We must remember that public health surges of the past century have been successfully eradicated by vaccines. Most notably are smallpox and polio, with hundreds of thousands of lives being saved for just that exercise. First and foremost, if you haven't done so yet, please, I implore you, get vaccinated. That being said, I have more that I can share with you today on the local healthcare infrastructure's state of readiness with regard to COVID-19 and potential community spread. In light of today's positive results, public health deployed a team to conduct contact tracing shortly after the results were received. Contract tracing is still ongoing right at this time. Staff members who had direct contact with the COVID-19 positive patients were placed immediately in a 14-day isolation as precautionary measures. For some time ahead of the current positive results, the Health Services Authority has been preparing any reintroduction of COVID in the community as part of its action plan for the reopening of the Cayman Islands borders. Now, due to the current positive results, these plans have been moved forward and implemented a few weeks ahead of schedule. Actually, if you compare to yesterday's uh, press briefing, it's less than 24 hours. As of today, the flu hotline is available 24 hours for people to call if they are experiencing flu-like symptoms or have any concerns whatsoever. To reach the flu hotline, please call 947-3077 or 1-800-534-8600. You can also send an email to flu at hsa.ky. The HSA flu clinic is also available starting on Monday, September 13 and will be open every week from Monday through Friday, 8 a.m. to 4 p.m., specifically for people experiencing flu-like symptoms. This clinic is located at the Cayman Islands Hospital at the far left of Accident and Emergency Department, and we're humbly asking people who are attending to park in the parking lot of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. 
Directional signage will also be placed so that you will know exactly how to reach this department. Out of abundance of caution, the Respiratory Care Unit, RCU, at the Cayman Islands Hospital has also been reactivated. This unit is moderately, is, will be used for moderately symptomatic COVID-19 positive patients who do not require ventilation. I would like to reassure the public that the HSA has adequate supplies, equipment, and therapeutics on hand to manage the present situation. To further protect patients and staff, the HSA will also be enforcing its visitation policy of one visitor per patient per day. All visitors must check in at the main atrium information desk and bring along with them a valid photo ID and a facial mask. Accident and emergency visitors should use the accident and emergency entrance and must also bring with them a valid photo ID and their own facial mask. As a part of this safety and prevention effort, face masks will be required at all HSA locations and this will be strictly enforced moving forward. Residents coming to the HSA locations are asked to please bring their own mask as they need to ensure that adequate supplies for personal protective equipment are reserved for their frontline healthcare workers. As you understand from this list of protocols, I have just outlined from the HSA behavioral changes and a dialing back of the easing of some restrictions with regard to daily activities is going to be necessary to curtail and prevent further community transmission of the COVID-19 virus at this time. We must all recognize that changing our behavior and adhering to COVID-19 suppression protocols will be vital moving forward. A key part of this following proper will be following proper hygiene, hand hygiene practices, maintaining social distancing, and wearing masks if required. A social distancing throughout attention of hygiene have been proven to be the best form of defense against the transmission of COVID-19. The following ways is doc documented and is proven to be effective. Frequently hand washing techniques with soap and water or an alcohol-based hand, hand sanitizer, remembering that hand sanitizers with more than 60% alcohol content are most effective in killing microbes. Cough or sneeze in a tissue and put it in a bin. If a tissue is not avail available, cough or sneeze in your elbow and not in your hands, with or without a mask. Stay at home as much as possible. Only leave for essential trips. Practice social distancing, which means staying at least three to six feet away from people who are not members of your household at all times. Mask must be worn in, in the public, but must be accompanied, accompanied with other prevention measures listed previously. It is recommended to maintain distancing where possible, especially in public places, and consider the use of masks, especially for the vulnerable. If you are indoors in a public place, a business may require that you wear a mask or face covering. Businesses have the authority to require any person who visits their establishment to wear a mask and refuse entry to any person who refuses to do so. You are still legally required to wear homemade masks or face coverings in healthcare facilities, residential homes or care facilities, prisons or place of detention, airports, taxis or omnibuses, 
and any other place specified by the medical officer of health. Please re be reminded, when using a taxi, omnibus, or school bus, the driver and all passengers must, we must wear a mask or cloth face coverings at all times. Beyond the following, um, these, pre these prevention suppression practices, it is imperative that we all follow and observe quarantine restrictions to prevent unnecessary spread into our community, as alluded to by our Commissioner of Police. These regulations are currently being rigorously enforced and we will continue to do so. For many long months in 2020, as a community responded so well to the often onerous and difficult requirements of a countrywide lockdown. Now, to avoid this happening again, let me implore to each and every one of you that we all do our individual part for, for the collective good and work to keep our islands and our loved ones safe in the midst, in the midst of this ongoing and exhausting pandemic. If we all work together and remain focused on our ultimate goal of safety, reopening of our borders, we will overcome this time of hardship and once again be a thriving community versus a surviving one. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your understanding and your cooperation. For education, the Honorable Juliana O'Connor Connolly. Panelists, ladies and gentlemen, wider Kiran, good evening. When one of my educational institutions were duly advised this morning that there was a distinct possibility that at least two of her students may have been exposed to the persons who have been tested positive, of course, that's not the news that you want to hear at any given time. So I was elated, delighted to have been informed by public health that with preliminary testing, those two students have tested negative. Um, nonetheless, we have put our protocol in place where they would now need to be quarantined for 14 days. Thankfully, the government had the foresight to provide laptops to our teachers and to each of our students where we can now quickly and efficiently and effectively move to remote learning so that they would not miss out from the curriculum at the school. And I am wishing to express my profound gratitude to Dr. Lee and Lizette, Dr. Williams, um, Dr. Jefferson, Dr. Brown, and all those associated and coming together so efficiently to implement the plan that we have in place. A plan is only good to academics if it's on paper. We have now passed that juncture, Cayman. We've now had our first test run in a long time, and that was today. So as I speak to you, fellow Caymanians and residents alike, I want to pose the following question. Is there not a cause for us to be still and be cognizant to recognize that we are fortunate that we have an ample supply of vaccinations, that we have highly qualified medical staff, that we have a caring government whose modus operandi is community built country, that we have an Abba Father God that there's still significant amount of our population who can call on him and rest on the confidence that he's delivered us before and he's more than able to deliver us again. But might we remind ourselves, Cayman, that there's a fine line between faith and foolishness. There is still ample opportunity to get yourselves vaccinated. The government is willing to come to you. I'm sure that it would not take much in mitigation with my honorable colleague, the Minister of Health, 
and this, the team under her to put these testing facilities within the district as, so that you can have a peace of mind. But is there not a cause, Cayman, for you to now take responsibility if you have been lackadaisical in getting your vaccination to go to the facility and ask? We want to have a good problem, you see, Cayman, where we have to get extra staff out to administer the vaccinations. Fortunately, for those two persons who have been subjective to this awful disease, COVID-19, they have been vaccinated. And although the jury is still out, we are confident, based on the scientific evidence, that their chances of survivability is greatly enhanced because they have taken the time to have reason. We would have note that one of the persons, COVID came to her. She's not out and about in a community, but because there are no, because there are no selectivity with COVID-19, doesn't matter whether you're 75 years old with underlying conditions or you're a student at one of my institutions, COVID is not subject to the rollover immigration policies. Neither is it subject to other immigration restrictions. It's in the air and it's looking for a host. Come, 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 Cayman. Let us reason together and get vaccinated. Because COVID is a moving agent, it's mutating to more complex variants. You have to take that responsibility, Cayman, and residents alike, to go and reach out. Because my students, unlike many other students in the region and the world, have gone back to school for face-to-face -face learning. And you owe it to the next generation, those of you who are eligible to be vaccinated, to protect not only yourselves, but my students, so that our curriculum and their learning and their opportunity that this government seeks time and time again to afford our students is available without undue interruption. COVID-19 is no longer novus actus intervenus. As I tried my best to explain the last time, it is a fact that it's out there. And that fact has come one step closer to home. You don't know, neither do I who will be the next host for COVID. So take this opportunity tonight. Sit down, your students, my students, have a heart-to-heart -heart talk with them. They are mandated to wear masks in the public transportation which the government provides. There has been some resistance with this. I pray that you will not only tell them about the importance of wearing their masks as they sojourn through the various schools, both public and private. But you will also encourage them that if perchance they have forgotten their masks, we do supply them. And so I'm happy to report today of the wonderful energy and cooperation between ourselves and HSA. When having spoke to Ms. Lizette, they have today provided although it was agreed from last week, not knowing about what would transpire today, 500 masks per school, and that's both public school and private school. Those of you who had listened to Finance Committee last week would have heard the safe passage of $200,000, $200 of member service being right, where we in the ministry put into our budget to buy five masks for our students, cloth masks, and five for our faculty. Those are in the process of procurement. So those that we have now gotten from Ms. Lizette and HSA, and thank you to the board, will be an interim measure. So government has met their responsibility. We have indeed filled our gap and made every single provision to protect you. We can only take the horse to the water. And even though we have attempted to put salt in the water to allow you to drink more, it's still ends up with you, Cayman, 
opening your mouth, as it were, to ensure your full protection. I pray that we will not have to have another unscheduled press conference, that you would take this serious as an individual and corporately so that we can protect our country and we can return to some semblance of normalcy as we continue to build this country. I want also to go on record to thank the financial services who have been the under pillar in assisting us from an economic perspective to be able to provide the necessary subsidies so that we didn't have to raise revenue or taxes and we have found ourselves in the most fortuitous position to offer these opportunities to our students. So as I conclude, Cayman, Take some time away from the television tonight. Take your children under your arms as your most precious possession and talk to them, which is perhaps a remote thing in some homes. Talk to your child. They are your responsibility and lead by example. And if you have, and you would know better than HSA, if you have members of your family who have not yet been vaccinated, Come, let's reason together. Each of us here will take the time out of our schedules. The same applies to HSA and all of our constituencies and our representatives to tell you that the opposition and the government may be divided and we may be in an adversarial democratic society, but one thing we stand firm on, that the vaccination and mass are the two things couple and saturated with prayer that are going to deliver us. So let us reason together and come tomorrow morning where there be a new sunrise in Cayman, where we can report that people have come to their senses and selfishness has been thrown into the sunset of today and we can arise as a jurisdiction that is exemplary to this entire global world. I thank you. Thank you very much, Minister Giuliano O'Connor Connolly. We now go to members of the media, starting with CNS, Wendy from CNS, who is joining us via Zoom. Wendy? Thanks, Donna. Um, sorry, I was a bit surprised by that. Um, can I go back to Dr. Lee, please, um, and right to the very beginning? Can you just explain, please, Dr. Lee, um, how, how um, healthcare workers were exposed? You said that somebody, that, that the patient checks in with respiratory problems, but they didn't take any, they, were, they weren't wearing PPE, or can you just clarify what had happened as to why they got, how they got exposed? Yes, I, I don't recall saying the person had respiratory problems. I think I said they didn't have respiratory problems, which is why right, they weren't okay. alerted. I mean, all of the people were wearing masks and gloves. Um, this is standard. But because this is so highly infectious, this patient needed some assistance from a number of members of the fire service, for example, um, to get to the hospital. Um, and because there had been close contact, even in spite of people wearing personal protective equipment, because there was, it was not thought to be a COVID risk um, for, the, uh, for the most cautious approach in order to protect the people that they serve, we've put them into isolation for 14 days. Um, so, so going forward, given the situation that the, the likelihood that this is in the community, is the hospital going to be taking more options in terms of um, how it handles all patients checking in? Because otherwise, we'd be in a situation where within a few weeks we don't have any staff left. Ab if you, absolutely, if you get my point. I, mean, I mean that absolutely, and that that has been the conversation today. You know, how could we prevent this from happening in the future? We'll end up with no staff, uh, and a number of different um, strategies have been developed by the senior management and the uh, in conjunction with the casualty team. I think for the details, you'd need to speak to the HSA team themselves, but I, I've been party to those discussions, and I know they've been working on it very hard in order to make sure there is continuity. Um, okay. Um, yesterday, I asked Dr. Williams whether he had any concerns that the that the virus had um, already leaked into the community, and he seemed quite confident that it hadn't, given this circumstance. Obviously, it has, and given the some more than 50 breaches of 
of quarantine that the police know about. So there's obviously going to be some that we don't know about. Um, how how confident are we now that this is not everywhere? And the, the only reason why we're I, not I think, seeing anybody yet is because every, a lot of people yeah. are vaccinated, so it's not until somebody gets ill that you're going yeah. to know about it. Yeah. I mean, I, th I think there's sort of two answers to the question, and, and although Dr. Williams and I often agree, I might disagree on this one, um, because I have been, I wondered how, how on earth we've managed to not have any demonstrable community COVID for all this time. Um, uh, there are little breaches all the time that happen. Um, you know this because it's a highly infectious disease, and even surgeons get patients who get infections um, all the time. Um, in hospitals, the people who are the best at infection prevention and control are constantly having breaches of their own in, 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 uh, and, and uh, microbes get into the body. We, we know that. So there's, there should be no reason why this wouldn't happen in the general community with regards um, the infection prevention control related to SARS-CoV-2. Um, however, yes, you're right, we are vaccinated. We have a, a large number of vaccinated people, which undoubtedly is a protection. Um, and, um, Wendy, I'm sorry, I forgot the, the other part that, that I was going to ask. I was to, saying that, that that's the obvious reason why we haven't seen it yet, is probably yeah. because the Delta variant is only just emerging yeah. big. It, yeah. it's, there's a lot more breakthrough infections, but we don't, we won't see it unless people are very ill, and therefore, as happened yeah. with the lady, she checks well, in. Yes, it, so we wouldn't have known that the other person was sick if she hadn't have been sick. Do you get? Do you get? However, what yes, I do. However, we do. We have continued to screen very actively a, a large numbers of the population. Whether they, and this is not something that's necessarily reported regularly. I mean, I re, I give that report. Um, but not in huge detail as, as I might have done eight or ten months ago. But we are regularly screening around the ports and around healthcare. And not only that, but we're screening members of the public because everybody that wants to travel, and there have been a huge number of people who have traveled um, over the last few months, they're all be being screened all the time. People are being screened as they enter into the hospital. So we are, in essence, doing a lot of general public screening for one reason or another, and we have not seen anything come up. So um, that is reassuring. OK, what about, given that parents now may be very may be concerned, is there any chance of us getting lateral flow testing so that families can test themselves to make sure that they're protecting their kids? Yeah, absolutely. So we, we've, already, we've been in discussion with um, um, Public Health England. They have an extensive list of um, lateral flow tests which meet um, uh, uh, a number of rigorous testing around sensitivity and specificity, and this list is some 60 or 70 long. However, the lateral t flow tests that we would, that I would wish to deploy in Cayman or recommend that we deployed, would be ones that would be at the right price point, bearing in mind the sensitivity and specificity, and also such that we wouldn't need experts because we would be ideally like to deploy them really quite widely so that anybody could basically, if there was any hesitation, yeah. they could do a lateral flow test. And Crown agents, who are the purchasers for the UK government because they have a large um, purchasing power and have managed to um, obtain quotes on a number of different lateral flow tests at very advantageous rates, so rates of around two um, British pounds per test, which um, is, is considered, you know, it, it, it's, it, it's a leaps and a huge magnitude of difference between that and a PCR test, which might yeah. cost $100, $150. And we'd like to deploy them, but we haven't needed to up until now. As we begin to open up, we are beginning those discussions about how we'd use them, how we'd get them in bulk here, um, you know, and, 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 and how we would share that, um, share those with the public so that they had easy access to those. Okay, thank you. Um, the other question that I have done around, probably for the Premier, it's more about regulations and things. If I could, can I ask those? Yes, those? please go ahead, Wendy. Oh, thank you. Um, I can't see, it's just I can't see on the screen. So I, my question to the main panel would be, um, how quickly are you considering changing regulations, if at all, say, for example, for um, crowd sizes, things like that? Or at this point, do you not see any need to change anything?
Um, we haven't had any recommendations to make any adjustments. Um, we will we'll, we'll have a fuller picture, as I said, um, in the coming you know day, um, the coming 24, 48 hours. So we'll see how things um, how things look. But at this point, um, there doesn't seem to be any any particular need to make any specific adjustments. But obviously, uh, we have the ability to move very quickly, um, and if it is necessary to do that, um, we will certainly be in a position to, to make those kind of adjustments and to respond to the recommendations from, from the public health team and from the program board who, who will be advising in respect of these things. Uh, also, I know that obviously the, the, the question of the 14th of October still remains there, but we still have some six week, five weeks or so before then. There, there has been some discussion. I know that I know the opposition are criticising about it as well, but it is actually a fact that five days probably isn't a, a long enough incubation period that people can still test positive for the virus ten, 10 days or more after being exposed. So are you still comfortable with just the five days? And are you still comfortable with people isolating on trust? Is that for me as well? But whoever, whoever wants to. Well, I mean, I, I'll certainly. <laughs> Sorry, Mr. Premier, I can't see anybody, so it's hard yeah. to uh, have yeah. to gauge who's looking at who. Do you know okay. what I mean? Um, in, in relation to the five-day quarantine, obviously, um, the advice is there is a degree of risk with that, <clears> um, but we were certainly advised that it was appropriate to to be able to move forward. Um, it's about trying to balance the degree of risk with, with convenience um, and trying to ensure that, um, you know, we do not unduly um, limit or inconvenience people, lock people down too, too much. Um, <clears throat> to be honest, even with the 14-day um, quarantine period, it, there, there, there are examples of people who tested positive outside of that. So there is no guarantee um, with this. Um, the, I think, you know, the advice that we've been given, we have relied on, and I think we're not, um, we're not disappointed. We, we understood, I think, that there would be this, you know, slight degree of, of risk. We obviously don't know where this, um, the, the source of this particular infection. Mm -hmm. It could be something that is completely unrelated to the issue of, of a five-day quarantine. Um, so we'll have to, um, you know, we'll have to work on getting that, that clear. Um, sorry, what was the other point that you made? Staying at home. Whether you're content to keep um, allowing people to isolate on the honor system without the bracelet. Well, uh, again, that is something which um, I think the, the um, Commissioner of Police um, spoke to in some, some detail in terms of um, the, the cases where um, we've, we've had a, a suspected breach. Um, they did, those, those particular cases after investigation didn't really reflect um, or involve the individual who was um, quarantining, um, sort of moving outside of what would ordinarily be their, their geolocated area. Um, it, was, it was more a case of, of um, exchanging items, um, sitting and, and talking through open doors and this, this, this type of thing. So I don't, I don't think there is the evidence to suggest that we need to address that right away. Obviously, um, we, you know, we can reconsider that at any time. If, if the commissioner advises that um, there, there are uh, situations where that may be happening um, and the, the question of, of um, geotagging then becomes very relevant again, obviously, we will re reconsider that. Okay, thank you. I'll, I'll step down because I know there's other people that want to ask. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, Wendy. Uh, before we go to the gentleman from the media uh, in the room, I have a few questions to ask on behalf of CMR as well as Cayman Real News. Um, the first question from CMR um, is asking whether uh, consideration is being given to introducing mass or making it mandatory mass to be reintroduced. Do you want to address that? 
Minister, or do you want me to do it? You can go. All right. <laughs> I think you alluded um, to it before. Well, I mean, we, right now we're recommending um, that yeah. people um, utilize mats when they go into areas which is high volume and enclosed spaces. Um, that is the, you know, the, the smart thing to do, particularly for people who are, um, who have some vulnerability. Um, you know, the, it, in terms of schools and that sort of thing, it, it is possible that we may get um, to that. But we, when, when the, if, if this issue of transmission um, can't be identified, um, obviously, I think we're going to we're going to have to rethink our our approach. Um, and we we would have been at this point um, if we moved into phase four, where we would require masking in schools, um, not just on the buses. Um, but I think, given um, that you know we have this situation right now, we we have to see how this plays out and what the particular circumstances were um, but I think there is there is a chance that we move in that direction at the moment we're not um, going to mandate that except as currently exists in terms of transportation um, on buses and that type of thing okay, what about um, vaccinations in school for kids who are able to get the vaccine any consideration being given to making that mandatory we have we we haven't had those um, those particular discussions around that um, there is uh, I suppose there is there will be some possible discussions there. We are we are really waiting to see what um, the UK uh, regulatory agency says in relation to um, in relation to the vaccines um, application for for younger younger children. Um, it could be that if that is if that is approved, um, we may reconsider the whole approach with with um, school children altogether. But you know, it's not something that, that we are going to be promote, promoting right now. Okay. A worst case scenario question is asking um, if the HSA uh, becomes filled to capacity or we have to go back into a lockdown um, and HSA is filled to capacity with uh, COVID-19 patients, uh, where can civil servants go for medical care? And um, if <laughs> it's a question. Yeah. Can I? Uh, somebody from somebody from the uh, medical field would need to will need to, to, to speak well, to that, but I don't think somebody's getting ready to answer. Maybe I can reiterate or reemphasize that is there not a cause? There would be absolutely no need to mandate vaccinations or masks if individuals took responsibility firstly to educate themselves, whether it's listening to press conference or talking to your medical practitioner, so that you will realize that it's for your benefit, no matter how much the government mandate. I mean, persons could do as we see in America. They could litigate against the government, or they could refuse, or they could still send their children. We're trying not to get to a, a, a jurisdiction in this developmental nation building process where it's becoming dictatorial. Government will do what it has to do when that time comes. But I would ask you again, Cayman, is there not a cause to sit and think and be still that is in your interest to wear the mask and get the vaccination? Mm -hmm. Thank you, Evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'd just like to reassure the public that the HSA is prepared for the reintroduction of COVID-19 into the community, um, which has been a part of our reopening action plan now for quite some time. So this is just a matter of moving that plan up a few weeks. And that's the reason why you've seen with the resumption of the flu clinic and the respiratory care unit being established. And um, once again, I just want to encourage persons who are experiencing flu-like symptoms, because there have been a number of people who've been experiencing flu already this season, to please stay at home and contact the flu hotline. The flu hotline is going to be answered by a healthcare professional that will screen your symptoms, screen your travel history, and advise you accordingly. If you, if you actually experience increasing symptoms, a deterioration of your health, you're then encouraged to call 911. Because what we don't want is a number, a large number of persons with flu to be turning up at the healthcare facility. So once again, I just want to reassure the public that you have a healthcare team 
we have our medical director here who has been meeting regularly with the team, um, both from the private and public sector, that is our health task force, that is combing the research and making sure that we um, update our plans, make sure that we are in the process of um, making sure that all the necessary pharmaceuticals are in place. We have more orders on, on, um, in hand as well um, to make sure that we at the HSA is prepared for any eventuality in the event that we should see increasing numbers of COVID-19 in the community. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ms. Sierra. We had a few more questions. These are from Cayman Real News. The first one is asking, I think Minister Turner might be able to address this, will the HSA offer home testing kits free of charge like the NHS in the UK to enable people to actually test themselves? That is something definitely that we will consider. And once it is a public health um, initiative, um, where the costing is concerned, once it's driven by public health, the government will support it. But again, these are all things, and hence the importance of us engaging with the community um, and having more frequent press briefings as we're, we're guided by those who are giving us advice that we will be dispensing from this forum in the coming days. Okay. The other question um, asks, uh, in order to encourage more to become vaccinated, some countries have actually um, introduced uh, a system where people have to show proof of vaccination to get into places, public places like, like restaurants. Is this something that Cayman may consider at some point? Mm. Do we I want think I've already there? gone down that path, um, and I have I have indicated that certainly that is something that is um, has been considered. Um, we we have not made any decisions um, uh, on that. Obviously, with with the um, hopefully imminent release of the the um, HSA's app um, that, you know, sort of opens up that possibility, but no decision has been made on that. But that's obviously something that, you know, could, could be considered. Okay. Uh, when you mentioned the HSA um, app, are you talking about a track and trace app? And if not, is that something we're considering? No, the, I, the, I'm, I'm referring to the, the app which confirms your vaccination. Okay, um, but there's a question here about a track and trace app like that has been introduced in the UK. Um, is that something that may be considered for here? You can track and trace people from their app, from an app. I'm aware of the app, but I don't know whether, uh, I mean, can someone else speak to that? I don't know whether that has ever been considered for use here in, in Cayman. I mean, given our size, I think um, it may not be that significant in terms of deployment to, to utilize or try to util, utilize that. Okay. No, no further. Okay. No further comments. Um, we're gonna, I, what yes. I can say though, that if persons who were a bit apprehensive and want to get vaccinated, they can do so this evening at the West Bay Health Center. And from what I'm seeing by reliable sources, there is a, a pretty decent crowd that's there. So that's encouraging. And this will continue uh, tomorrow at the Caymana Bay location, tomorrow and Saturday from 11 to 3 uh, tomorrow and 4.30 to 7 at Caymana Bay. Also on Saturday, because we're no longer doing it at Owen Roberts International Airport, uh, back at the Caymana Bay location starting as early as 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. And then they'll take a break and they start back at 4 until 7.30. What people need to uh, remember is to wear your own masks and bring your photo ID with you, a valid photo ID with you. And also, if you're going for your second dose, it's imperative, it's very important that you bring back your first card. Okay. Oh, sorry, one final question before we move on to the Compass and Caymanian Times. Um, uh, Mayor Panton, you mentioned earlier that uh, about the 24 to 48 hour window and not really encouraging people to have large gatherings. People want to know exactly what size large gathering would you consider a large gathering as some people seem to be, you know, they're talking about going to the bars and, and having parties and so on and so forth. Well, I think we, you know, we can leave that to people's um, sort of own <laughs> assessments, but I mean, it, it is you know, if you, if you have more than five or 10 people gathering um, in, in an enclosed space, um, that may be um, a consideration. Look, it isn't going to hurt for people to stay home and, and have a relaxing evening, um, you know, not, not go out to, have to attend parties or go out to bars or that, whatever it is they're doing. 
for 24 hours. Let's just do, um, you know, what we need to do in, to, to try to ensure that we have our hands around this issue so that by tomorrow afternoon we have a lot more clarity and hopefully we can, you know, we can be sure that we understand what, where this, um, the, the source of this infection and how we need to behave going forward. Thank you, Premier Panton. I, I also want to go back to your question there about the, because uh, it's been bothering me a little <laughs> bit, the question about, um, you know, the where do civil servants go if, if the hospital is full? I mean, the reality is we are, the health services, the public health department, government, everybody is going to be monitoring the situation. Um, I don't see a situation where we will end up with, you know, hospitals overflowing um, with, with people. I don't, I don't foresee that happening at all generally, but um, we're not going to be in a position where we have no options open. We, we are going to be taking actions ahead of time in a, in a proactive manner to protect the people of this country. That includes every one of the civil servants in this building. Exactly. Thank you very much, Premier Panton, and to the panel. Um, I'd like to call on Andrell Harris from the Compass now uh, for questions. And while he's coming to the, to the podium, remember, HSA is more than ready to, to get the field hospital up and going. And that field hospital is really to house those patients who may not need to be ventilated. So they're automatically preparing to deal with COVID positive uh, residents uh, should they have to be tended to. Um, so I agree with the Premier. Okay, and the field hospital, if I'm correct, has 60 beds? How many beds? Yeah, Eight, 80. 80. Zero. Okay. Yes. Thank you very much. Um, Andrew? All right. Thank you, Donna. And uh, thank you, uh, Attorney. You answered one of my, one of my questions hey. there without response. So <laughs> Telepath. I'm off the list. <laughs> uh, first thing, can you say whether or not, our, whether or not this, uh, the <coughs> recent positive cases were the Delta strain or not? Not at this time. Can you also confirm whether or not the, these two cases were linked to any of the breaches that have since been reported and are, that are currently being investigated by police? Again, not at this time because contact tracing and getting the relevant information is still active as we speak. Okay. All right. Hence, we will be having another press briefing tomorrow. No. Earlier, while you were speaking, Minister Turner, you made reference to several um, several details that were a part of the regulation, components of the regulation, such as wearing masks at public places, the hospital, so on and so forth, um, on omnibuses or public transports. I've seen many public buses drive to and fro across Cayman Compass, at Compass Center on Shedden Road. Several of them filled with no one wearing masks. Are you, in light of the recent cases, is this something that the police will be stepping up on as far as enforcement is concerned with this new call for people to take the virus more seriously? Again, by way of getting this and results that we really hope um, we never get again or that we get total control of what transpired or is still transpiring. But um, when you look at people taking collective responsibility and adjusting their behaviors, bearing in mind over 100 days we never had um, community spread until this presented itself today. So of course it's human behavior that they become more, more relaxed and we're hoping that with this incident happening today, us appealing for people to adjust their behaviors and all enforcement measures and those personnel on the front line ensuring that our, our protocols are being upheld in accordance to current public health legislation that are in play will be adhered to. Okay, thank you. Uh, Minister O'Connor Connolly, can, just for sake of clarity, is it business as usual at Clifton Hunter High School tomorrow? Unless I get a Novus Actus and a Venus between now and tomorrow morning, it will be business as usual. Thank you. Premier Panton. Yes, sir. How does today's announcements uh, affect the border reopening plans? Well, obviously, it doesn't, um, it doesn't help um, the consideration of all the, um, the issues around that. Um, but, you know, 
what is really important is how the plans and systems we have in place actually um, you know work out and demonstrate our ability to respond and our resiliency um, over the you know let's say by tomorrow afternoon when we have a clear picture as to what the full results have been um, and what the what the full picture is um, it will obviously be concerning to to folks we have been saying for a long time and let's go back um, to July when we first introduced the plan um, we made it very clear that this is as we move along the, there were stages or phases to the plan in which the levels of risk would be ticking up initially it was going to be ticking up very slowly and then <clears throat> basically by phase four which is October 14th it was going to go up a lot higher now that is why we've had um, a lot of reaction um, to that because we're closer to that point we've been emphasizing this reality and the fact that um, we want people to go out and get vaccinated because this is one of the major tools um, that we have in order to address this this risk um, it doesn't matter which government um, was in office today if they were trying to reopen the economy you are going to have increased risk of COVID you're going to have community transmission the, and the community needs to uh, face that risk learn how to be responsible uh, learn how you know the, the way we dealt with it last year um, addressing our, our um, personal um, our private health issues um, addressing collectively how we behave how we interact with others in public how we wear our uh, comply with public health protocols wear our masks um, sanitize our hands all this type of stuff all these things are issues that that we're not going to go away it's not not going to change if we have a plan going forward um, which involves increased risk which involves reopening this is the reality and we've talked about that um, I understand we understand as a government the concerns that people have we understand and we've certainly been getting the representations from people saying you know you need to reconsider this this is this is something that is th what's happening now is just a reflection of of what could have happened at any time but what is certainly likely to happen going forward once we start um, reopening and you know removing or limiting further the, the the quarantine you can't reopen the country you can't have open um, borders with um, a 14-day quarantine or a 10-day quarantine or a five-day um, quarantine for everybody so it makes it more difficult it makes it difficult for us to manage it it makes it difficult for us to make that decision because we care about the people in this country we care not only about what we think their the impacts may be on their health going forward, but we care about how it impacts them psychologically, mentally today. Um, so the, it makes it more difficult, makes the whole consideration of the of the plan more difficult. There's there's no denying that. But it is it does reflect a reality of you know there is no plan that that avoids this type uh, type of risk. Nothing avoids this type of risk if we're going to have some degree um, of open borders. Now, just one, just for the sake of clarity, the positive patients, will they be tested before they are released and are they going to be required to go through the five-day quarantine or 14-day quarantine in light of the fact that they were vaccinated? I Perhaps think, Dr. Lee I might be able to answer that. Could I say that? Yes, and 14. I said 14 days. Am, I, am, am I coming? Clear PCR, 14 days. But Dr. Lee can expound on that. Yes, I think um, it's um, the situation in Iran is different to other countries, so we've always erred on the side of caution because we have no widespread community COVID. So we are asking and requiring those who have tested positive in their immediate contacts to quite. Twice. Okay. Um, and two more quick questions before we go. Unfortunately, um, Minister Bryan, who is here, isn't here, but perhaps is anyone able to uh, 
provide an update on the raffle prize for the successful person who is who takes the double job. If not, um, we can defer that uh, maybe until tomorrow because our primary tomorrow. focus was dealing on what's eminent right now and just and on calming the fears of the people. In that vein. Given Minister Turner's remarks about the sudden rush to the West Bay Clinic, if we run out of the 3,000 plus vaccine, or rather if the 3,000 plus vaccines are used up, Governor Roper, can you say whether or not another shipment will be brought in? Yes, absolutely. If we, if we, if we need to get more, we can get more, but we absolutely have to use what we've got first. Okay. And it's not if we run out, it's when we run out. <laughs> <laughs> Good place to be, actually. Right. <laughs> Thank you very much, Adriel. Thanks. I'd like to now call on Ralph Lewis from Caymanian Times. Uh, good afternoon, members good of the afternoon. panel. And, um, I have two <coughs> questions for Dr. Lee and a, and a, and a request. Dr. Lee. Yeah. Um, welcome back, Dr. Lee. Uh, just a <coughs> clarification Thank of Thank the Thank you, Ralph, and good evening to you. The clarification of the last one of the questions Andrew uh, mentioned. Anyone who tests positive, are they automatically quarantining for an additional 14 days? Um, yes, that is that is what we are currently practicing. I am well aware that other countries have lesser quarantines or isolation periods for people who test positive, but that is what we have practiced and are continuing to practice for the moment for the safety of the community. If we didn't have widespread community COVID at a low level, where there's not a lot of sickness being generated, but we know there are a lot of positive cases. We may well revisit that and reduce the time period because it wouldn't make any sense. Um, because we know that people are less infectious towards the end of that. But at the, for the time being, it is 14 days. Okay, thank you. My second question is um, regarding this um, incident that occurred. It appears that we may have the results within a day or two. Um, would the, the information be published regarding the situation, how the um, COVID transferred from the infected person to these people? Of course, with um, ma maintaining yeah. confidentiality. Well, absolutely. I mean, everybody wishes to know. We want to know. We want to learn, and we want to share those experiences um, for the public, um, so that we, the whole community, you know, learns together about this. We are we are one community, and we would share that information. Okay. okay. And my final request is: in the past, I've asked for more information on the regular statistics that we get. Um, information is key, and you mentioned that you may not have the resources to provide the detailed information that we requested. Um, do you think that going forward, as we get ready to open the borders, that we could provide more detailed statistics on those daily numbers that you give? For example, when you report on the number of people that were positive and negative, can you say where they were coming from and, the, and that's that information? Can you give more information going forward, please? If you'd like me to do something else that I do now and drop that, yes. Okay. But, um, <laughs> unfortunately, <laughs> nothing has really changed. That's the card, Ralph, I'm sorry. I will provide a list, and I think that information is important and it helps people. I uh, absolutely agree with you. I absolutely agree you feel, with you, Ralph. It was something I would love to do to feel comfortable with what's happening and may encourage them to take the vaccine or other things. And of course it avoids speculation. <laughs> okay, Donna, that's mm -hmm. all for me today. See you tomorrow. Okay, thank you very much uh, for that, Ralph. Um, okay, I, would, I have a couple of final questions from the public. Mm -hmm. um, the first one is, uh, what would trigger a lockdown, another lockdown? I think it is going to be um, advice specifically from our, our public health team that we need to seriously consider doing that. Um, that means effectively that um, something really unexpected has happened. Okay, I think before um, you mentioned, uh, or it was mentioned in one of the press briefings, uh, speaking uh, specifically about the clusters, whether there were various clusters popping up. So, so, so just in relation to that, um, the plan that we have we adopted in July and published really doesn't say we're anything about locking down. What it says is that we will reassess. There will be a trigger event to reassess um, consideration of, of public health um, issues if we find during each of those phases phases that 
we have two separate um, groups of, of infections and um, which result, I think, and Dr. Lee, you can correct Require me if I'm wrong, but which, result, which re result in hospitalization. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think that the, the plan actually says anything about locking down. Okay. Um, clearly, locking down is something that is common in many other places. We've certainly, certainly done it here um, effectively. Um, but obviously, going forward, th these are ty the types of things you want to try to manage um, the, um, the situation in a way that you avoid those. Um, so we're not contemplating that if this happens, we're going to have a, a definite lockdown, but clearly um, there can be situations in which we are advised by um, public health officials and, and the, the broader um, perhaps even the, the program board, that this is, this is really the option that we must, uh, is most prudent and we must consider doing it. Okay. Um, another question, this, may, this is for one of the HSA uh, experts, the health experts. Um, which pharmaceutical drugs or medicines are we currently using to treat uh, COVID-19 patients? Dr. Jefferson? Yeah, well, thank you very much, um, Donna. Um, I'm, I'm happy you asked that question, actually. <laughs> Because um, it gives me the opportunity to just um, ask the community to be careful with what they are asking for with respect to prophylaxis. Uh, recently, we've seen a number of patients, a number of persons, um, going to the physician asking for ivermectin at very high doses mm. to um, be used as um, a prophylactic um, for prophylactic measures. Uh, yesterday, for example, we had a patient who was given 18 milligrams, which is, the, which is not a recommended dose, and 75 tablets of 18 milligrams. Now, I am using this platform to beg my colleagues not to, um, not to do this. I mean, there are some specific indications for ivermectin, but at a lower dose. Um, patients who have been exposed to coronavirus who are symptomatic, who, um, these patients who do not have severe disease, so they are mild to moderate, there is a, an indication for ivermectin at a human dose as opposed to the horse and cow <laughs> and donkey dose. So it's very important that um, I get this out there into the public so that the public is aware. So now to your question. Um, we've been um, fortunate for us. We've not had many patients admitted with, with um, COVID. Uh, we're very fortunate in that the vaccination program, that's working. Those patients, we've only had less than 2%, like 1.6 or 1.7% of those persons who are positive with COVID that have made the way, their way to the hospital for, for treatment. So it's really a very small percentage. And those patients, we have standard recommended treatment for those patients. Now, there, um, there are ongoing, uh, there's an ongoing um, research. There's, there's quite a number of different um, reputable institutions and organizations that have made recommendations as to how best to, to manage these patients. And um, now it's much clearer than uh, 18 months ago when not much was known of this, of this um, disease. And um, we have, depending on mild, moderate, and there are certain criteria that has been shown by the evidence um, to require a particular approach depending on fulfilling these criteria. And so we have the drugs that are available, and there are some new ones. We have the, these new uh, sophisticated biologics that's now on the market, and uh, we are trying in we, to, to acquire some of these. So some of they, they will call them the MABs. These are um, immune modulating drugs, and we're getting some of those. But by and large, by and large we have uh, most of the drugs needed. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Jefferson. One final question before final wrap-up, um, final words. Uh, this person wants to know, they're saying that the new mu variant is now in Jamaica, with the health minister there just confirming 26 to 
some 90 samples tested were positive for its presence in Jamaica. Are we screening for this new variant here in Cayman as yet? Jefferson? Uh, thank you again. So uh, yes, uh, fortunately, we've, um, we're a small, small island, but we are very fortunate in the sense that we have the technology available to say what the variant, variant, variants are. Uh, we have a fantastic team of molecular biologists, and they're currently working tirelessly to late, late night, early mornings, looking at all the positives, identifying the, um, the, 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 um, the strains. Mm -hmm. And so, yes, we're able to identify whether or not it's the mu variant or the delta variant or the lambda variant. Um, and, and that is where, as a s small island, I am absolutely proud that we're able to detect and determine the various variants. Now, with respect to those cases that were most recent, mm -hmm. uh, within the next 24, 48 hours, we will know the variants. Um, in fact, I'm pretty sure we'll know it before, before 48 hours what the variants are. Um, I'm pretty sure we'll know it before 24 hours what the variants are. And, um, and, and so, yes, to your question, we are able to say um, whether or not we have the mu. So far, we have not had any um, evidence suggested that we, suggestive of the mu. And we'll see um, when we get the results within the next couple of hours what variant this, this particular, this, these two most recent cases are. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Jefferson. Any final Thanks. words from the panel? Uh, just in relation to that, um, Dr. Jefferson, before you, you leave, just to confirm, the, the mu variant is, that is stated as a, a variant of interest. It's not a variant of concern like the Delta variant. Is that mm -hmm. correct? Um, yes and no, in the sense that both the, the, the Delta and the Mu, the, there's not a, as much known of the Mu as, as is known of the Delta. Delta has been around from, for a longer period of time. The Mu variant um, is a, a variant of concern. It, however, um, has the potential of causing um, as serious a, a, a disease okay. as the Delta variant. Um, but the, the interesting thing about this COVID is that we've, we have to sort of keep our fingers on the pulse of what's going on because as an RNA virus, they are so sinister in the sense that they change so frequently. Mm -hmm. So what we had 18 months ago um, is architecturally different from what we're seeing now. And so that's why it's important to keep our fingers on the pulse and see what we're seeing. And, look in, and, and now we're able to be able to detect based on the, um, the phenotype, based on how these viruses uh, are appearing, where they're coming from. You know? So we know um, it's most likely to be coming from North America, um, coming from Europe, coming from Brazil. And um, there are certain specific features of the, of the RNA that sort of gives an indication as to the possible location, you know, locality of where these viruses originate. But um, the new, hopefully we won't, we won't get it. It's not as much known about it as compared to the Delta so far. But based on what we're seeing internationally, it is a one, one to be concerned about. And we still have to be, you know, searching to mm -hmm. ensure that we don't get it. Again, Dr. Jefferson, any final words from the panelists? Huh? Go uh, out and get vaccinated. Yes. <laughs> please. We, we can't no. hammer that home enough. Uh, I, I want to re reiterate the, the pleas of all of my colleagues, um, and, and in particular, um, my colleague, Ms. Ms. Um, Juliana, um, who has been so passionate in, in um, asking people, asking the people of our country to really think through the implications of taking a position of not wanting um, to, to get the vaccine um, and understanding that this vaccine we're getting for free from the UK. It is one of the best vaccines in the world and it really has demonstrated its ability to save lives and it is going to, it is key to us, to our strategy going forward. Um, I want to thank uh, His Excellency um, and both of my colleagues generally, those who are in, in, in the audience. And I want to thank those people who have um, been with us now, um, probably close to, close to two hours. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Donna, for all the, the good work you do. Um, and I want the people to, to, of the country to understand that we are working very hard on this issue. We're working with this wonderful team of people 
um, throughout the civil service, throughout the Health Services Authority, all the public health folks. Um, we're working very hard to make sure that the people of this country are safe. That is our number one priority. So I want people to understand that, and I want people to be able to sleep well tonight, and tomorrow we'll, give, we'll be able to give them further information, um, and we'll be able to move on from there. Hopefully we'll have complete clarity on it, but <laughs> there's no guarantees on that. Um, so thank you all very much again. I really appreciate it, okay. and we'll see you tomorrow. All right, thank you very much, uh, Premier Panton, and to you, the public, and of course, the media, and our panelists for all of this vital information. Um, of course, you can watch this press briefing again on, on the CIG television uh, YouTube channel. And remember, you can go online to gov.ky as well as hsa.ky for the latest on vaccinations and COVID information. Until tomorrow, have a wonderful evening, everyone.